Yo, what's going on my people? Welcome back to the Lift Capital YouTube channel where life is for the taking. Now today I'm going to be talking with you guys, of course, about a recent VeChain partnership. We're going to be exploring DLT based trade finance projects and I'm going to be introducing you to what are synthetic central bank digital currencies. Guys, it's a good one. Let's get into it. My people, my people, welcome, welcome back to the Live Capital YouTube channel. Like he said, life is for the taking. Now, as you guys can see here, our market is in a bit of a dip right now. Your Bitcoin is right here on its way to 23. Your Ethereum's right here at 16. Look, look what we have right here. Your Tether and USD, they're back on their peg. Really good to see right here. Your XRP right here at 37 cents. Moving forward right here, uh, you're going to understand we do focus on utility cryptos and mostly ISO compliant cryptocurrency. So just going to touch on those real quick. Your Stellar's right here at 11 cents. Algorand right there at 32 cents. Like I said, we're going to be talking about H or uh, excuse me, uh, VeChain. Your Hedera's right here at 7 cents. Uh, Quant, Quant right there at 103 uh, Moving forward, of course, IOTA. We definitely have some IOTA news for you guys. And as well, let's see where our XDC is up. Oh. Up, did the guy get bumped out? It looks like our XDC may have been bumped out of the top 100 to right here. Which, again, guys, if you don't know, if you're new to this channel, XDC at these prices is a steal, a great steal. Now, I went on ahead and uh, did some digging for you guys. So, everybody wants to know exactly what's actually happening outside of this whole crypto world. You know, everything that happens with these geopolitical factors. If you don't know, it's all about these three words right here the great reset, the great reset. Now, I'm going to be showing you some of the excerpts from the managing director of the IMF, and she had said this in the middle of the year in 2020 i'm bringing you guys all the way to the bottom of the speech right here where she said now is the moment now june 2020 in the middle of the pandemic now is the moment to step up and use all the strength we have all the strength that the imf has influence clout all of that to turn the page in the case of the IMF, we have a $1 trillion financial capacity. Did you know that? The IMF has a $1 trillion financial reach and a tremendous engagement influence on the policy side. They're saying that this is the moment. Right now, what we're living, what she announced two years ago, that this is the moment to decide that history will look back on this as the great reset and not the great reversal. So right here, I want to show you all just this is like a uh, test beta like a like a video so you guys can see it minting native tokens in firefly is a breeze over 1250 different tokens have been minted in the first 24 hours extremely fast and without fees all made possible through the ShimmerNet beta so that's all out there on iota if you don't know iota is going to be your internet of things iso compliant crypto so they've been building okay they've been building their ecosystem you have shimmer you have assembly all of that that's being built but right now, if I have anybody that's really wondering, well, where can I store my IOTA? I want to get it off of the exchanges. Firefly is it. This is what we're talking about. Firefly wallet. Of course, uh, I believe Ledger does have support for Firefly. So think about that. Of course. Now, VeChain is announcing right here that they're, you know, everybody comes to VeChain for supply chain management. Well, now VeChain announced that they're signing a partnership geared towards carbon management, blockchain based carbon management. Now, if you're been familiar, we've talked about this. I mean, even Uphold has taken on uh, certain carbon decarbonization projects and everything. Truly, here, we do believe that this is going to be very lucrative in the future. VeChain announced a strategic partnership with Amazon aimed at leveraging cloud computing and blockchain tech in a bid to bolster carbon management services, scale operations, and meet those targets uh, in China. So interesting stuff. Of course, Amazon knows all about uh, DLT. For my Algorand holders, set a reminder for the Algorand DeFi AMA with AlgoGuard tomorrow. As you guys can see, it's going to be a Twitter space going on uh, August 3rd at 9 a.m. Eastern. So, guys, tune into that. Now, right here, I thought this was quite uh, interesting. You have Cointelegraph really putting it out there. We do talk about XDC Foundation. We really do talk about how global trade can really be, you know, influenced. And um, it's just rife, just ripe for, for blockchain. So right here, this is a really good article. I want to show you all a few pieces up out of it. How blockchain tech can revolutionize international trade. Blockchain technology has proven to be transparent and could make international trade transparent and even more secure. So before I get into this thing... Um, I'm going to be showing you all some other projects that are going to be involved, but 
they do a good job in this. Uh, it is also a common notion that blockchain is only a technology for Bitcoin. However, that assumption could not be more wrong. While the technology emerged alongside Bitcoin in 2008, today its use cases have evolved far beyond crypto. From finance to e-commerce, food safety, voting exercises, and supply chain management, its applications cut across virtually all sectors of the global economy, including areas directly or indirectly linked to international trade. All right. So keep that in mind, my people. What they're saying is everyone is seeing the use cases, but think about it. Who are they talking to? The people that are really in key with global trade. So further on right here, they get to talking about some use cases. In another use case, IBM and Maersk has worked on a blockchain based solution to streamline the global shipping global shipping industry. The project project is called Trade Lens. It's designed to digitize the entire shipping process on a blockchain. The ultimate goal is to create a more efficient and efficient and transparent supply chain that can speed up delivery times while reducing costs. So far, the project has been successful in onboarding over 150 organizations and major operators in shipping companies. According to uh, IBM, Trade Lens has processed over 150 million shipping events. So look at this, guys. Right here <clears throat> is coming from the Trade Finance Global. A list of DLT based supply chain digitization projects right here up front trade lens just so you guys could see. OK, trade lens collaboration between IBM and Maersk for a trade platform for the supply chain connecting the entire supply chain ecosystem. The platform is underpinned by Hyperledger fabric. OK, Hyperledger fabric. We've talked about that. So I'll leave you guys a link so you can peruse through that. Now, right here, big shout out to the guy, uh, Michael Crypto. Again, this is really putting it all for you so you can understand how XDC is really going to be working in what we've just talked about. So this right here is the, the DDoc components are basically a digital document components, all the components that would be needed to digitize trade finance. Right now, trade finance is, is largely paper based because these paper documents represent ownership own, you know, represent, uh, you know, different things, obviously, for security and ownership and whatnot. So uh, as you guys can see here, digital container, electronic uh, signatures and seals, digital uh, notary, all of that can be done through Trace Original in EGO. But my point is that it's all a part of an initiative right now. Global trade needs to be digitized and XDC in EGO, All of these initiatives are going to work towards that. So right here, Bloomberg put it out from the wipeout of cryptocurrency and a plunge in NFT token values. One thing is clear about celebrity endorsements. It's been a disaster. OK, <laughs> right here, celebrity uh, crypto endorsements gone wrong. Where are they now? Right here, crypto ad spending down as celebs go silent. A-list celebrities went quiet after the market's recent sell-off, facing increased criticism that they encouraged their fans to invest in crypto while failing to properly inform them about their risks. In June, most crypto companies reportedly cut down their marketing spending by over 90%. 90 percent, including both digital and TV ad campaigns after splurging millions on various campaign deals, such as the ones with the above uh, celebrities. Some of the top companies that have invested in crypto, crypto.com, Gemini and Coinbase. Ooh. So, guys, right here um, this is my main piece. I want to really show you all is talking about synthetic CBDCs. Now, regardless of how you feel about them, this is coming out from a um, international you know, an IMF. A uh, publication that was actually discussing back in 2019. OK, 2019. So you guys already know where we're going with this. They were already announcing a new look at the international monetary system right before the pandemic actually really hit. OK, so all of this stuff is just we're putting pieces together here, my people. So just I'll leave you guys a link for it. What the guy is talking about is just risks and e money, e money. Right. Which is pretty much just you can think of it like crypto if you want to. But right here, guys, this is really fascinating. Synthetic CBDC. I would like instead to draw your attention to the fact that while we're focusing on alleviating risk, on protecting consumers and financial stability, we inadvertently, inadvertently created central bank digital currencies, a new version that is which we call synthetic CBDC. Yes, if e-money providers can keep client funds as central bank reserves and if these are protected from other creditors, then by proxy, e-money uh, users can hold and transact in a central bank liability. Isn't that the very definition of CBDCs? So, again, guys, what I'm talking about is this mix between the public 
and the central bankers. You get what I'm saying? That this that they can have uh, people that will be holding reserves of these CBDCs, and then me and you, retail investors, can take advantage. But meaning that they can just be involved. Synthetic CBDCs have notable advantages relative to the full-fledged version of the previous presentation, in which the central bank creates tokens and offers those accounts to the public. Synthetic C- Synthetic CBDCs outsource several steps to the private sector, technology choices, customer management, customer screening and monitor, uh, including KYC, AML, all of those things. You hear that? So a lot of people really feel like when you have CBDCs that are going to be involved, that strictly the central banks will be involved. They'll control. They'll this. But with these S CBDCs, they're going to be giving all that. They're going to outsource all of that to the private sector. So all sources of substantial uh, costs and risk. The central bank merely remains responsible for the settlement between trust accounts and for regulation and close supervision between that issuance. If done appropriately, it would never need to lend to providers as their liability will be fully covered by those reserves. Again, we're talking about uh, that that uh, that settlement. OK, we talk about Project Hell Video. We talk about Dunbar there. They already have projects to make sure that they could speak with each other. Right. But let's actually dive a little bit more and know a little bit more about synthetic uh, central bank digital currencies. So that, again, is going to be your public private CBDC uh, collaboration. And I really do like how they uh, go into it. I'm just going to show you all, I guess, this as well. So how e-money works. Imagine an e-money institution, EMI, intending to issue e-money to end users in Germany. To be legally allowed to do so, the EMI must first be granted permission by the ECB, the European Central Bank, and the German Federal Financial Supervisory Authority, BaFin, to issue e-money. Once the permission is authorized, the EMI can begin issuing that e-money so the e-money creates e-money digitally and exchanges e-money units at a one-to-one exchange rate to sum up the e-money setup the end user requests the exchange of euros for e-money units see e-money units crypto and pay the amount it will be exchanged to the emi the emi then pays this amount to the trust fund or directly into its bank account this money works as a backup of the e-money units that the emi issues to the end user so again, of course, it's just going to be allowing um, more and more work uh, and and acceleration. Circling back to the definition of uh, SCBDCs, as stated in the introduction, SCBDCs can be described as a type of central bank digital currency in the form of a public-private partnership in that e-money providers can keep client funds as central bank reserves, being able to hold and transact in the latter. That was basically coming from exactly the uh, excerpt we were just talking about. So figure here, as you guys could see, is a uh, authorization for those um, for those uh, CBDC synthetic CBDC setups. The end user would just pay that issuer. All that would work. And then the claims, the authorizations, and then the end user will receive uh, the e-money again. So S CBDCs can be seen as a specific form of a CBDC for a detailed discussion. Uh, C. Klein Sander. When referring to SCBDCs, one might wonder what the term synthetic implicates. The answer lies in the public private partnership between the EMI and to whom the central bank provides its reserves. In the case of a CBDC, central banks are the operators of the CBDC system. And in the case of an account based CBDC, offer accounts to the public. In a synthetic setup, Various tasks are outsourced to private sector institutes, institutions, which are all sources of substantial costs and risk. The ECB in this case would only be responsible for managing those tasks, like we said, therefore saving resources. Hereby, the central bank is not offering accounts to the general public, but instead to private EMIs who then use those synthetic CBDCs as a 100% backup for their e-money. This is an important difference between CBDCs and SCBDCs. Y'all, it gets real. It gets real. Another advantage is that disruptions to the current system and infrastructure are small. One change is that access to central bank money is extended so that central bank money is distributed to those institutes. However, in contrast to the CBDC, the ECB 
would not have to introduce a new legal tender with all its legal consequences. Furthermore, the innovative private sector distributes and manages those synthetic ones so that more innovations can be expected compared to a situation where the public sector is in charge. Y'all, it, it, it keeps on getting more and more just real and real and real. So I will definitely leave you all a link for that. But to wrap this one on up, I thought this was really good. This is a visual, um, just so you guys could see, this is the future of NFTs, okay? All the different things that NFTs can really can do. Uh, unique digital identity, identity standards, tickets and passes, artwork, uh, profile pictures, intellectual pr uh, property, voting records. Can't wait for that, okay? Everybody wants to make sure that we're actually voting on the blockchain, right? Music rights. So yeah, guys, just to open your mind, you know, it's beyond the, the AP pictures and the penguins and all that. Clearly, clearly non-fungible tokens definitely have a use case, all right? But I appreciate you making it to this part of the video please hit the like button hit the subscribe and as well hit the bell so you don't miss out on any of these updates but i'll holler at you later peace